Bow wow wow, yippee yo, yippee yay, bow wow, yippee yo, yippee yay. Hey, bow wow wow, yippee yo, yippee yay, bow wow, yippee yo, yippee yo, yippee yay. play with me you hear me don't play with me all right never forget who you're dealing with okay if you have not already done so please remember to like share to facebook and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the youtube and if you are not already a part of our book club please remember to hit the patreon link below and or the join button and for a small monthly fee of five dollars you babies yes you can be privy to all the shenanigans before before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about George Clinton part two. So now we got money problems, okay? Because there are there is more money going out than it is coming in. I would imagine if you got 85 people on set with you and all of them got a drug habit, I'm sure. And on top of that, you got Silk Rose Royces, the Great Gazoo, uh, 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 HR Puff and stuff, uh, Banana Rama, the Go Go's, uh, Blink One Eighty Two, and uh, Ted Nugent on stage with you. I'm sure, okay, you're broke right now. George Clinton is saying that they are all anti tours, anti tours, yes, anti tours, right? Because there is no lavishness no more. Fucking props. Fuck them props. We don't need them props no more. Uh, uh, you, your, your costume, you done got too fat for your costume? Well, I don't know what to tell you. You better pick up some chinos and a jean shirt or something and come on down and some flip-flops. The funk mob has to find their own way to get into these gigs now. In 1979, Clinton said that after this, I'm retiring, okay? Because the anti-tour was so bad. He was like, I got, uh, 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 because... I can sit in my suburban house, you know, in my studio and spin records, make beats and sell them and write songs and do ah, ah, ah. I don't have to do this no more. The problem with that was, is that by him falling back, he wanted one of the funk mob members, one of the originators to step up. That didn't happen. The group sort of faltered without George Clinton being in the middle as the sun with the funk mob orbiting him. So now the band is hostile because they believe that George was snatching their money when in actuality it was the record label who was in control of their money, not George. Now this is what the George Clinton say, okay? That's what he say. Now I'm gonna tell you a reason why, you know, I look at him kind of sideways in a minute, right? But um, I'm saying to myself, well, wait a minute. If y'all wasn't on drugs 98% of the time, you might have been able to keep up with your money, Funk Mob. Okay. The originals left. There was a divide between the Funk Mob, okay? And everybody is mad over the money. Now, like I said, George Clinton is in the studio making beats, okay? One of the people who he was working with was Roger Troutman from Zap. Roger Troutman was a childhood friend of Bootsy, okay? So basically, you know, I I believe that there would be a trust already established, okay? All right. You know, Leos, they can be vicious, but they are trusting people. He in the, in the studio working on this Roger Troutman album, okay? This is supposed to be for CBS Records, okay? As a note, Roger Troutman took the production to... Warner Brothers 
and sold it to them right underneath of George Clinton's nose. Now, I know that the average listener would say, oh, that's messed up. That's messed up. Answer no. Okay, because let me tell you about George Clinton, right? If I did not read the Rickety James book, I wouldn't know who George Clinton's personality was or what his personality was, right? Even though both of them was junkies, okay? Both, well, I don't know. I don't think either one was um, uh, uh, on dope, but both of them was both on Booger Sugar. If you recall... Uh, Rick James uh, was selling drugs, high quality booger sugar, right? George Clinton knew this. He also knew that Rickety James was trying to get into the business, right? So George Clinton would call Rickety James and be like, hey, Rick, won't you bring some of that good booger sugar over here, okay? Now, while Rickety James is over there talking to someone he admired highly, okay, because he is the original funk master, okay? Rickety James was the funk prince, okay? No, the punk funk prince. Rickety James is explaining to George Clinton all his dreams and, you know, aspirations of being a part of the business. George Clinton is selling him the wolf tickets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, baby, I got you. Yeah. Steady sticking all Rickety James stuff up his nose, Okay. So this boy Dream said, I'm going to introduce you to these people, to my people. Ah, ah, ah. Rickety James gave this man thousands of dollars worth of boogity sugary, okay? Several times until the third time he didn't get, you know, the third time Rick James got the picture. Okay, wait a minute. He ain't, he's selling me dreams now. But the fact that George Clinton threw Rick James, young Rick James into a trick bag, you know, and took advantage of the fact that he sold drugs and saw that Rick James had um, aspirations. He took advantage of him. That's not right. That's dirty. You know, now Rick James also said in his book that maybe George Clinton um, saw Rick James as a threat and had to let him know who was the true king. As the 1980s rolled around, the funk mob was bombarded with lawsuits, so much so that the musical output ceased okay oh no oh no as soon as we create the music and the money is generated the people's going to come after it so no i ain't making another nothing you won't get no more music out of the funk mob answer no now still touring the checks are getting smaller and smaller bootsy collins says it turned into a bummer and it wasn't fun anymore they are now touring without a record label support and they're sneaking out of hotels because they can't afford to pay the rooms and board. In Detroit of 1981, Parliament Funkadelic played the last gig. All the members received $20 and a bus ticket home. As a result, the mob either picked up random gigs, joined other bands, or just left the music industry altogether. Now that's heartbreaking. Clinton retreated to his suburban home outside of Detroit playing video games and smoking crack. Hey, listen, it's the 80s. Everybody got a piece up. Not me. I didn't do it. You know, I'm not mad at those who do do it, though. You know, I'm going to say get help, but it happens. Okay. It's a lot of people's story who resemble this. Okay. You get into a situation, you get depressed. Next minute, you know, you're smoking crack. Now you're depressed because you smoking crack. So then you start, ended up smoking more crack. I get it. So. Okay. Despite all, he signed a contract with Capitol Records as simply George Clinton. George said that this was something that he had never done before, okay? Out of all the acts that he created, it was like 10,377 acts that, you know, blossomed from the funk mob. He never created simply George Clinton. All of the funk mob returned to work with George on his first solo album. Clinton says, although there may have been money problems, he knew and did not even think twice about the fact that he knew that the funk mob would return because after all, where he is is where home is. And it's true. And they were there and they worked on his album for Damn. free. Not to mention Okay, he's smoking crack, right? Yeah, he's smoking crack, but did this, okay? Even another reason for him to be a little, you know, shaky. My nerves is bad right now. My nerves is real bad. The boogeyman was after him. If you don't know who the boogeyman is, I hate saying it. I hate if you say that nigga's name. Fuck. 
Too many times he will appear at your door. I know this. I am a testifier. Okay? If you say the RRS too many times, them niggas will show up at your door. Lucy Collins said that George came to do the record, Atomic Dog, and didn't even know what the hell was going on. He was so high. Okay? Because he's still smoking D-crack. Right? He just got on the mic and just started vibing. And what did they create? Atomic Dog. Atomic Dog was immensely successful. And because of that success, George Clinton kicked his drug habit. Just to prove it, he said that he walked around with a crack rock around his neck. I'm saying to myself, uh, the police ain't say nothing about you. You know, you couldn't get, you ain't get a possession charge or nothing like that. But he said he walked around with a valve of crack around his neck just to prove that he could stop using okay he equated using crack with um you know destroying the music and he said he didn't want anything to get in the way of the music you know george clinton likes to do things the way that he wants to do them right but the record label said no okay so in 1984 he was in financial trouble again in 1985 he filed for bankruptcy it happened. So Next, the Red Hot Chili Peppers contacted George Clinton to produce an album for them. George Clinton appeared on um, the David Letterman show and Saturday Night Live with his song, Do Fries Go With That Shake? Do Fries Go With That Shake? In 1988, Clinton reached out to Prince and said, Hey, look, I need you, man. As a result, the Cinderella Theory was released in 1989. The advance from Prince made a small dent in his tax debt of four hundred thousand dollars. Do the when you back. don't get taxes taken out of your uh, money, like on YouTube, I don't get taxes taken out, and I understand that it's hard for you to, you know, at the end of the year, want to give back your money, you know, that you created, and then now you like, well, shit, why do I gotta get a tax man anything? But look, we live in America, okay. Now, in the uh, day of social media, we know that America is full of shit. And part of the things that, uh, in, that is incorporated into America being shit is the tax. Then De La Souls, me, myself, and I, and MC Hammer sampled his music, creating huge hits and huge payoffs for Clinton. And at first, the original members was like, wait a minute, don't be just giving our music away. Don't be just doing as we created, but then the originals understood that this is a way of keeping their music still alive, okay, or keeping their music alive. I'm telling you, George Clinton has the funkiest beats ever. The only person that I would say is as close to, you know, like Clinton's, uh, 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 let's say his technique would be Dr. Dre. Okay, and Dr. Dre ain't created shit that was good since, I don't know, since a long time, okay? But we all fall off. Like I said, nobody can be on top forever. Not even Beyonce. So do y'all remember when y'all stoned Murray J. Blige for that Burger King commercial? What's in the crispy chicken wrap? That lady ain't do nothing but try to make some goddamn money, okay? George Clinton did the same thing, okay? Y'all was mad at him because he went around there to the Burger King, you know, shucking and jiving, okay? George Clinton said, listen, I understand, you know, what y'all feel, but I got to pay the boogeyman around here, okay? Fuck all that you talking, you know? Y'all like, oh, it's integrity. You're compromising the integrity of the music, blah, blah, blah. George Clinton don't give two craps about the integrity of the music. That nigga is trying to pay back the boogeyman. Nonetheless, Prince did bring him back to the limelight, but because Prince had an ongoing battle with Warner Brothers, which was also the home base for Paisley Park, it was issues for George Clinton also. Now we're in 1993 with Hey Man, Smell My Finger. I, I don't know if that works in, or that would work in 1993, but okay. Next, he's at Lollapalooza, and now he is in front of a whole different genre of rich white kids enjoying the funk. Why? Because they probably wasn't listening to it before. Now you got a whole bunch of rich white kids supporting him on tour, listening to the Funk Master. We want the funk. Hey, give us the funk. Ah, oh, we need the funk. By the end of the 1990s, George had employed several of his family members to assist with his musical 
kingdom. Now, this is this is beautiful, okay? When this be happening to these people, these artists, you know, they be in constant battle with these record labels to get their masters and royalties and ah, 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 right? So, like George Clinton was saying, I didn't get the money. You know, I don't own none of the music. These two, you know, labels that's, you know, battling back and forth, they own the stuff, not me, okay? Come to find out that the two companies that was battling, neither one had access to the money or neither one was uh, had a right to the money or the proceeds from anything that the funk mob did, okay? So, of course, the funk mob sued for $20 million and they won, okay? But they still ain't seen no money. In 1997, George Clinton and Parliament was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Prince presented it to his friend. Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. Now, remember this. The same people you meet on the way up will always be the same people. That you meet on the way down, my naysayers, my patron loves you babies. Have a good one.